Welcome back everybody. Um, I hope you had a chance to grab a drink and stretch your legs. Um, we will move on with now to the second part of our afternoon session. Um, I'd like to introduce you next to the lovely Colin Evans, who's a clinical nurse specialist at Guy's and St Thomas's. He's going to be giving us a little tour on family history taking, or what I like to call the poor man's genetic test. Um, Colin, over to you. Thank you and uh, good afternoon, everybody. Um, my name, I'm just going to bring myself, I'm going to bring my presentation up first with help. That one? Yeah, sorry. Thank you. Liz is in the background giving me just good advice. So as I said, my name is Colin Evans. I'm one of the clinical nurse specialists for inherited cardiac conditions at Guy's and St Thomas's Hospital. Um, I'm just going to give a brief overview about these, uh, the role and some of the things to consider in family history taking. So uh, just some of brief sort of uh, learning outcomes and maybe understandings I want to sort of communicate this afternoon is around why we undertake a family history, um, the relevant information to document when I'm taking family history. We will consider factors, factors to consider when counselling for a family history. And I'll just use a brief case study to show key aspects of drawing a family tree. Uh, just some reflections on the end on the key issues to highlight, maybe some educational resources, and current considerations when you are counselling for family history, and then I'll try and answer some of your questions. So the first question is, what is a genetic family history? You know, we, as uh, healthcare professionals, we're all familiar with asking about uh, the medical and family history of uh, individuals. Sorry, I'm just going to sort of change my screen. I've got a different screen. Um, so a genetic family history consists of information about the biological relationships between families, um, the, any medical conditions they may have, also the genetic status of family members. Um, it enables us to formally and officially document this information, and it is usually uh, represented in the form of a family dreams or sometimes referred to as a family pedigree. It gives us a visual and pictorial representation of multiple generations, which is easier to access and uh, interpret and sometimes medical notes. As uh, Antonis mentioned earlier, like the family tree is a fundamental and integral part of um, helping with diagnosis and treatment for patients with genetic conditions. It's normally undertaken in a clinical consultation and in, can be undertaken in other environments as well and it normally involves a series of questions to identify family relationships and their medical conditions. Um, as you can see from the right hand side, there is um, a number of uh, standardised symbols and lines used, which, is, uh, which allows healthcare professionals around the world to understand and interpret the information uh, from the family tree. And also, it, we have to uh, bear in mind, this is a clinical document, so therefore uh, it's safe, sto appropriate storage, sorry, and confidentiality should be respected at all times. So it does have a brief overview on why it's important to undertake a genetic family history. Firstly, it helps in the diagnosis. Uh, it allows us to refine or define a particular diagnosis in the family. We can look for similar related features, um, symptoms within the family and establish if they are correlated to each other, uh, which may lead us to finding the diagnosis within the family. It can also help identify if there's already a single or multiple genes conditions within the family, identify the variability of how these conditions express themselves for each individual. Also, there's the fact that it might lead us to offering uh, genetic testing for the particular patient we are seeing. Uh, also, it, it shows the uh, look, helps us look at inheritance patterns. So this helps us to recognize whether there is a specific pattern of inheritance in the family and identify the type of inheritance. So therefore, within um, in inherited cardiac conditions, it allows us to look at the risk to other family members and then plan and possibly recommend cardiac screening, as Nabil was mentioning earlier. In addition to this, it allows us to identify other family conditions, uh, such as cancers, neurological and metabolic conditions that may require referral to other specialised genetic services for the patient or her family in the future. 
to be some uh, consideration given to family members who are not documented or missed from the uh, family history and also the implications for that of the risk that's posed to those individuals of not being considered, especially in this circumstance for cardiac screening. It also brings clarity to the family, you know, especially around the patient, patient and the possible implications of their genetic diagnosis uh, and who may be at risk in the family. Also, it helps us to clarify misconceptions uh, with the individual, uh, whether it affects certain individuals or genders within the family. Often there's some confusion uh, about who should be screened first and if it's a gender specific uh, condition. And finally, one of the most important factors I feel is that it uh, starts to build a relationship, trust and rapport with the fam individual and their families, which hopefully benefits them and us over the long term. So just some just briefly, we'll look at some of the information um, required for a family tree. Uh, so the key information or preferable information is obviously we need to know the proband, the informant, the patient. Uh, dates of birth, um, family relationships, so any diagnoses that uh, could affect family members. Obviously, with deaths, uh, we document them as um, appropriate. Um, obviously, for any information in regard to uh, pregnancies and maybe uh, terminations of pregnancies or uh, miscarriages. Also, we have to give consider uh, consideration to um, whether certain sort of inherited cardiac conditions can affect um, certain uh, communities. So documenting ethnicity might be appropriate at times. Also, there's specific cardiac information we also need to document. Uh, anything around sudden unexplained deaths, as was covered earlier, may be relevant to the person, or sorry, the proband that you are talking to. Um, any cardiac conditions that have been diagnosed in the family, um, any particular symptoms which may not have been diagnosed or uh, treated at this time. And also we have to consider other information such as uh, developmental and learning disabilities, uh, any congen congenital anomalies, uh, occupational and possibly environmental exposures to the patient and any particular medications that they are currently uh, taking. So we, just some of the factors we need to consider during our counselling session, we're undertaking a family history. First of all, it's the, whether, what's the purpose? Why are we asking this? Often our first um, consultation with the patient is when we want to undertake it and they may you know, not, be, not be aware what the significance and relevance of asking about a family history is. And also they might have other sort other sort of issues on their mind or want to discuss other things regarding their condition. Also, just keep and keep um, just watch their reaction as well, whether they feel comfortable doing this and uh, whether they wish to go ahead with it. Also, there's the process of obviously seeking their permission to undertake the family tree. Um, normally, we, we verbalize this. So it's not sort of a written consent, and I've not seen a written consent yet, but certainly it's that, going back to that trust issue, the information uh, they're sharing with you. With regard to time and setting, is it the right time to undertake a family history? Uh, you know, have the family, are the family able to communicate that with you at, at that time? Should you maybe consider another time for do it, to undertake it? Is it in a setting where there is privacy is maintained, where you're not going to be disturbed, where people aren't coming in and out, where, you know, you, you don't sort of find yourself uh, able to sort of talk about things freely and openly? So with language, it's obviously one of those things we need to be careful of and avoid certain words. So in this case, I mentioned the word pedigree earlier in terms of the family tree. Um, I think obviously the connotations with our canine friends, um, you have to be careful and that they don't imply to the patient that we are talking about some other something else. Uh, also, are there barriers to communicating like language, 
and obviously if somebody um, requires uh, so assistance with that also the tone and sensitivity of your conversation should be considered One of the key things is don't make assumptions, especially around um, relationships within the family. Clarify, you know, relationships, uh, gender, adoption status. Um, also about medical information. Uh, maybe the, the one of the family members has already been treated for a cardiac condition. They might have to be like a pacemaker. Don't assume that is relevant to the current or possible condition you're discussing with the patient. And also, is it who is it accessible to? You have to discuss with the patient who you're sharing the information with, and whether it's and who um, should it should be available for, especially in terms of other healthcare uh, professionals, uh, where it's being stored as well. A lot of the time these days, we do a lot more electronic storage, and therefore it may be open uh, for other people to see. Disclosure. OK, so, you know, the main consideration, it's not a test for the particular patient, uh, so we don't have to pressurise them and, feel, and push them at that moment to try and establish what's happening uh, or, or the information they want to uh, give us. Also, consider what you're writing on the family tree and whether you want the patient or proband to see that and other family members. Also, is the proband going to share the history um, on the history and information on the family tree with other family members. And finally, you, uh, for questions, you're going to have um, to ask quite a few difficult questions, possibly around consanguinity, pregnancies, partners and parents, which, you know, the patient might not feel comfortable in uh, talking to you about. Just a brief few notes here, but, but prior to counselling, a document on an appropriate paper or specialised worksheet or template. Uh, there may be local ones available to you, or uh, there are there is stuff. There is a template on Health Education England. Uh, for this, for, for the case study coming up, I've just created my own little template just because my writing is terrible, and I wanted to see, so you could see what I how I was doing a family tree. Um, there may also be local electronic courses of resources available to you. Two key components is, and we, and I do see a lot of pedigrees without this, is the date and time you've done it, and the name and signature. Keep any notes brief and relevant. These aren't, you know, medical notes, notes where we write everything. And also, you can leave some information out you don't think is relevant at that moment. Uh, obviously, use a pen. Um, it's as previously mentioned, you should be three generations minimum. And just for the sake of this particular case study, I have changed all the na names and dates of the family. However, I was involved in their care and undertaking a family tree. So what we can see from this is that we have patient David A, his date of birth, his gender, and obviously the hospital number is not real. So there are the notes there. And we, do, we represent David by a box and we, we uh, undertaken a shaded box, which are the symbol, which are uh, down here for the symbols, which is hypertrophic cardiomyopathy in this case. So next, his relationship status. We can see that he is in a relationship with Tracy, and we've undertaken a horizontal line there to indicate that he is in that relationship. So then we focus more on first degree relatives, as Nabil was mentioning earlier. So we can see that we have the um, line of descent there from the uh, parents to the children. And we have the sibling line here. And the individual uh, child line, uh, individual line for each child here. And what's noted here is that there is a double line indicating their relationship, which um, indicates that they are possibly, they are, well, they are blood relatives in this case, so they're in a consanguineous relationship. And you can document that fact on the left-hand side to make it easier to interpret. 
And also there you can see we have uh, identified all the first degree relatives. Uh, there's a sibling and uh, David A has two children. Also then you move on to the next generation. So you can see there the second degree relatives are the grandparents, um, the, um, the uh, aunt, and there's also um, been a miscarriage on the maternal side and also his uh, nephews through his sister. And finally indicates the uh, third degree relatives. Uh, so there we can see the connection between his grandmother, his maternal grandmother and uh, paternal grandmother who are siblings. Also, it indicates other family members, third degree family members that we might need uh, information and to be aware of. And this just summarizes then the uh, five generations of family indicated in this pedigree. So just briefly, I hope I give you just a brief interpretation how to draw a family tree. Just some reflection, obviously the information belongs to the patient. So we have to treat it with care, confidentiality and be aware how we store it. Um, also, the resource is for healthcare professionals to work with the family. Um, so it's an ongoing process. We may add, we may have additional information from other family members in the future. And also it's, you know, a work in progress in some respect. If you are interested in uh, looking or sort of practicing or getting more information about, about drawing a uh, family history, then there are resources via the Health Education England website and the British Society for Genetic Medicine. It is something that comes with practice. It doesn't come straight away and certainly not for myself when I started this uh, role. And it takes time to develop the skills to do it and also the time to undertake it. Um, for the future, it's a question of, are we going to be able to introduce electronic formats into drawing um, family histories? Um, you know, currently we use something, we use a program called GeneWorks. Uh, I understand that other institutions use ProGeny. And also the phenotypes was available, but I believe it's now licensed and is behind a paywall. Also with um, the pandemic, it's been, a, I'd say, more challenging to undertake uh, family histories, especially over video conferencing, which can be temperamental. And then obviously if you're on the telephone, you don't tend to be able to have that same bonded connection with your patient. And obviously, you know, it's about raising a, a public awareness of what we do and making the public aware that there is, you know, more information, you know, and relevant information to them may be appropriate for us. Thank you for listening. And those are my references and I'll try and take any questions of you. Thank you, Colin. That was a fantastic and very, very clear talk. Um, drawing a family tree can be really quite difficult sometimes, so you really showed us very nicely how to do it, uh, plan it out generation by generation. Yes, thank you, um, Colin. Um, I'm a massive advocate for everyone in healthcare being able to draw a family tree because obviously it extends beyond inherited cardiac conditions. Um, you did touch upon um, within your talk the, the issue surrounding storage. Could you just elaborate a little bit more on, on that subject and what is considered best practice for storing family histories of this nature in a pictorial format? Well, I suppose currently what we undertake is, you know, seeking consent of the patient, explaining to the patient we are going to store it and whether it is available to them is key. You know, from a nursing perspective, we do say this will sit in your medical notes. Now, what yeah. format that takes, um, you know, in each individual institution is, is, is always, is, you know, subjected to what their policies are. But also, you know, we have to make it clear to them that, you know, it's not going to be available to everybody and that they have a choice at any point that we don't share it with either healthcare professionals or other family members. Lovely, thank you. And in terms of um, then other people being able to, um, if you've got someone else in the family and you need to access that information, what would you do then? Would you complete another family tree or would you um, look back at previous other family members trees? I'd say, you know, you have to be careful, especially with the information you're writing on the family uh, trees. You know, it may be a case you might have to do another one or 
and redact the information you've written, especially. And that's why it's key, obviously, it's not, the, you know, these aren't medical notes, they're not thorough. They're meant to be a guide for all of us at the end of the day, Absolutely. just to highlight things. So maybe you have to redraw the pedigree with less information on there. Also, you know, I think it's been it's it's been slightly different, you know, doing most now these family trains via video consultations where you're not sharing it so much anymore. Yep. You know, and it'll be interesting to see if we go back to you know more face-to-face -face, um consultations, you know, how that works and how we have to be how to address how you know how how careful we have to be with, with the information we have. Perfect. Thanks so very much, Colin. That was um, an excellent talk. So thank you very much.